you can find that on YouTube. We're going to go back to the very top. Okay, so that I thought would be a better job. Freya Pataki is a professor there. We stayed up for longer than 15 minutes to be Mr. Rocket. So hopefully I, I have your attention again. Um, so the question isn't if fires can occur. Hopefully that short video clip kind of put that in your head to occur in Southwest Florida, but rather when and what type of fire. So this is just. State. This is just some stats for wildfires across the U.S. between 2000 and 2017. That video when they were talking about the largest amount of acres, that was 2015. You can see 2017 was just under 10 million acres. The number of actual individual fires, if you follow this red line, it was around 65,000 individual fires that happened in 2017. Okay, so I thought I'd throw this in. So, kind of going back to what Wally was saying, how the trees are like these five gallons of fuel. This is what I imagine sometimes the wildland firefighters look at, especially thinking with this upcoming fire season. You know, you look at the forest instead of seeing trees, you're actually seeing fuel and potential matches, and saying, okay, we're gonna get the hose. You see all this, this, this fuel. If I stand on the other side, I can't see you guys. Okay, so for some of you who are on the firefighters, this is, this is going to be a review of basic, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about, everyone keeps asking me, what's going to be the upcoming fire season given our low snow and everything that's happening? And before you can really answer that question, you need to understand, well, what is fire? So fire, so the first thing, and I reviewed this, I can actually have Mike maybe give this talk in this section. Um, Fire triangle, there's three components. There's oxygen, we have that. There's heat, so there's natural sources, lightning, there's unnatural, so like light and creek fire, the missionary ridge fire, those were on natural emissions. And then we have fuel. So in this case, we're talking about our forest. So one of the key things to understand how this year's low snow pack, that we have impacts or could have an impact on our future fire season is to understand the different phases of fire. And so there's four phases to fire, and the first phase is one that's often overlooked because we tend to think of fire as just ignition. But there's this pre-ignition phase that needs to happen before we can actually get to the ignition phase. And what needs to occur is in the wood, the moisture and the volatile oils and gases need to be removed through a heat source from that wood. So if you think about when you build a campfire, if you go and you get wet wood, you're going to get smoke. Smoke is just, it's combustion that is incomplete. And so what needs to happen before you can get that ignition is you need that moisture to be removed and those volatile oils and those gases are actually what's igniting when we're seeing ignition. And so how this relates to our snowpack is that if we have low snowpack, then we have less moisture that's getting absorbed into those down fuels and moisture that's available to live trees. Then if we want to understand how the fire is actually going to behave, we need to look at the fire behavior triangle. And so we have this conic line between the fire and the fire behavior triangle of fuel. We can look at the amount and the arrangement of fuels. So if you look, for example, in Congress Pine Forest, what you just saw in the video, that there's been a buildup of fuels, you have that arrangement, it was talked about those ladder fuels that are now able to move the fire from the surface, up in the canopy. Topography is kind of set, it's, it's a geological time scale, so that's not going to change. But slope, having southwest facing slopes, uh, I mean aspects, and then steep slopes, those are going to be higher spread rates than if you're on or facing the east facing slope, and that's flat. And then weather, we can't predict what the weather's going to be this summer. We can look at some forecasts, which I'll show you, but the wind, temperature, relative humidity, precipitation are all going to impact how fire will behave in our forest this summer. And so if you look at these variables, these all relate back to the amount of moisture in our fuels. So if we have wind, that can 
through evaporation we can remove moisture, if we have warm temperatures, the temperature of the solar radiation can actually preheat those fuels. And if we have low relative humidity, that's releasing some of that moisture, and obviously if we don't have precipitation, we're not adding moisture back to those fuels. Okay, so I pulled this up last night. This is for the San Miguel Dolores and Anibus in San Juan River Basins. And on our y-axis, this is looking at the snow water equivalent in inches. And essentially what the snow water equivalent is, is if you would take the snowpack at a certain volume and melted it, how much water would you get? And then we have the calendar water year. It starts in October, goes to the end of September on the x-axis. So here in this red, we have 2002. That was the year of Missionary Ridge Fire. Here we are, as of yesterday, 2018, you can see the AMB cell rate was slightly above 2002. Um, but if you look at the statistically, essentially, we're in the same boat as 2002 right now. If we look, here's 2017, we had 1997, that was the big, one of the big cover years, what we did not have this year. But so when we're looking at trying to forecast and think about what our upcoming fire year is going to be, we can look at all this information, but really we need to kind of see what's going to happen from this point forward. So if we look at 2002, essentially right around this time is when we reached our maximum snowpack, and it started then melting off rapidly. But by mid-May, essentially the entire snowpack was gone. If, if we have a similar trend like this, then we can kind of go back and look at that fire behavior triangle, we can look at the fire triangle and say, okay, we're not going to have that moisture in our fuels, and that we're going to be, the fuels will be at a more ready state in the pre emission phase because that moisture has already been removed. We don't really necessarily a large heat source to actually ignite and then get these fuels um, to ignite. So what we can do then is we can look at some of the forecasts that have been made. So this is the U.S. seasonal drought outlook, and this is valid from just last week, March 15th, June 30th. And what it's saying here in southwest Colorado is that our drought is going, we're forecasted to persist through June 30th. And so one of the things that has a big impact on our fires in southwest Colorado is around, well, it used to be around July 1st, when the monsoonal rain would come in. So if you think about it, we used to have snowpack, especially from high elevations, lasting until June. And then we'd get our monsoonal rain. So that was the driving the amount of moisture in our fuels. And that's why in the subalpine we see fire return intervals of 150 plus years because those fuels really never had a chance to dry out to even ignite. Where now we're having spring runoff occurring earlier and that's happening in mid to early April or May. And from that time until we get the monsoonal precipitation, those fuels are just sitting there and they are drying out. And so they are already doing that pre-ignition phase just through solar radiation without actually needing some type of heat source to ignite those fuels to get them ready to burn. So this is just looking at the three-month precipitation outlook for March through May, and the temperature outlook. Essentially, this is saying there's a 40% probability that we are going to be below average precipitation between March and May. In southwest Colorado, when we look at the three-month temperature outlook from March to May, in southwest Colorado, it's a 50% probability that we will be warmer than average. All right, so here I'm going to get my crystal ball, and I'm going to tell you what the fire season is going to be. Actually, I'm not. So let's go back. So hopefully, based on all the information that I've given you guys, you can then use the information that I've shown you and think about our behavior triangle and have a better understanding yourself of what the potential forecast would be for our forest here in Southwest Colorado. So, so topography, it's not going to change. 
fuel, we know the amount of fuel that's out there, the arrangement, we know what that is. Click one more. And then the moisture. So again, we have somewhat of an idea what the moisture of the fuel is going to be, but we still don't know. We're going to know pretty soon. In the next two weeks, we're going to start getting some cycles, some storms coming in, we're going to get you know, that late spring precipitation. Happy spring, happy yesterday, so we are officially done with winter. So what happens in spring is really going to impact what's going to happen. But if we start, it starts getting warmer, and I walked in here at night, 60 degrees, and we don't get that precipitation, we're pretty much going to have these fuels dried out, and they're going to be primed for ignition. And then the last one is weather, and again, what we can do is look at this forecast that I just showed you, and it's saying that there is a probability that we're going to see in the next couple of months drier conditions and warmer conditions than on average. And so this is then just looking at that weather, and what we can see basically is that for Colorado, the annual mean temperature increase we've seen over the past, this is just showing 30 years, but really what we've seen over the past 40 years is that we've had around two Fahrenheit increase in temperature in these environments. Okay, so what did the forecasters say, the professionals? So for May and June, the wildland fire potential outlook in southwest Colorado, what we're seeing is above normal for significant wildland fire potential. And so basically, they're going to use the same kind of logic that I just went through, that I took you through, to kind of say what is going on, what is going to drive how our fires, fires might burn, or what's the potential this summer. So, to kind of turn things around instead of looking gloom and doom, so what do they think that we do? So think globally, act locally. So globally, one of the things that you can do is get informed. So we need to recognize that global forest decline is impacting global climate and therefore our forests in southwest Colorado. So one of the things that if you guys are familiar with, there's this website, Science Daily, and for those of you who want to keep up on the current research, you can go and you can subscribe. They have all different topics, and essentially what it does is it puts in a more friendly form than really a long 15-page scientific paper a little synopsis of the current research that's going on. And so in my email feed box every couple of days, I'll get an article and I'll tell me what the kind of current research is, and then if I'm interested in that paper, then I can go get the scientific paper and read the whole thing. But at least it keeps me abreast of what's going on, and you can choose as many topics as you want. But for example, tying this global impact in southwest Colorado, I got the inbox on the Amazon deforestation is close to a tipping point and how that due to deforestation is affecting the hydraulic cycle, which is affecting the amount of rainfall in the Amazon forest, which is affecting reforestation in these areas that have been deforested through slash current agriculture and logging. And by changing the amount of precipitation that we're having in our equatorial regions, it has global consequences. And so we need to realize that all of the warmer than average and drier than average is all connected. And so I think staying informed is one of the main things that you can do on a global scale. So this is just looking at some research here. Our, our forest locally, we can see that you know the dominant forest cover is found in Brazil, it's found in Canada, Russia, and the United States. This was a study in 2010 looking at forest cover loss. And what it found between 2000 and 2005 was that the actual highest amount of forest loss was actually in North America. So it was looking at this region in Canada, Alaska, and the United States, lower 48. And that was primarily due to wildfire and to insect outbreaks. And that if we look in South America, it was less from deforestation and those types of outbreaks down here, from deforestation and those types of things. The other important thing to realize is that we are having mortality not just due to fires and insects, but to drought and warming. Can you click here? Oops, go back one. One more. Yep. Okay, there we go. So, 
what we, a new term that was coined by Rushers and Hall was global change type drought. What this is referring to is drought occurring near warmer temperatures. So a lot of people say, well, we've had droughts before. We have, but what we're seeing are these warmer, hotter droughts, and so this is affecting the trees and causing higher rates of tree mortality. So this is a paper by Craig Allen and others in 2010. It was a summary, kind of looking at the global overview of tree mortality due to these type of global change type droughts. And all these little numbers, these are all scientific research papers that they found in the literature related to this type of tree mortality. And so some of that we're seeing right here in our backyard in southwest Colorado. This was a paper looking at tree die off of our pinion pine. So this is a photo in 2002. So all these brown beetles, this is a result of this global change type drought. Two years later, you can see those beetles have fallen off and those trees have died. This winter, people started noticing, as Gretchen's here, she was quoted in the Draco Herald article, that juniper trees across southwest Colorado are taking a serious turn. And so juniper trees generally are more resilient to drought than pinion pine. So people are kind of complex, why is this happening? So what we're seeing is kind of this browning or reddening of our juniper trees. And primarily it's happening in Rocky Mountain juniper. And so there's some research at Fort Lewis College and students who are looking into this. But one of the things that's happening that researchers and forest land managers are hypothesizing is that because we've had these average than, warmer than average temperatures this winter, that it's kind of throwing these trees out of whack. So it's warmer, so they're wanting to start to photosynthesize. So all the needles, they're opening their stomata to allow gas exchange so they can photosynthesize. But when they do that, they're losing water through transpiration. And so that's where we're kind of seeing probably this response to the grounding of the needles. One of the things that we've seen is that so far these trees haven't shown signs that they're dead. Buds. So hopefully, in the next few weeks, we'll actually start to see growth. And once photosynthesizing starts to occur, then maybe these red and brown needles will green back up. But there's a similar phenomenon that's called red rust that occurs in logical pine. So this might just be something similar that's happening in these junipers that we haven't seen before. We don't really know what the answer is. Okay, and so... No, no. So what are they thinking that can we do? So locally, so get informed. So thank you all for coming. You're, you're doing your part, joining local organizations. So there's lots of tables here, the Mount Studies Institute, San Juan, Citizens Alliance, Firewise, to get involved and kind of get knowledgeable, write letters, share information, participate in community-based science, manage your personal property for forest health, Resiliency and support land management of public lands for forest resiliency. So, MSI, they have a group in San Juan Headwaters for self partnership, and they're really trying to create these resilient forests in the face of this warmer climate and drier environment. So, we're going to go back to the video.